Well, thanks very much, Chris, for those very kind words. I think we all have an enormous amount to think about from what was said this morning, so uh, I am rather uh, feel rather apprehensive in seeking to add to it, but uh, perhaps some recollections of uh, Jakarta and the situation at the time will be of interest. And Jakarta in early 1965 was certainly a unique and really abnormal place. It was terribly run down, since while Sukarno was still unchallenged as the national leader, and he was, after all, the country's first and only president, his interests his interest did not include the nation's economy. The issues that were of interest to him, the campaigns to gain control of West New Guinea and to crush Malaysia, had made and were making great demands on the economy, which was already suffering since nationalisation of foreign-owned plantations had led to serious falls in foreign exchange earning exports. There were almost no shops where you could, get by, where you could buy imported goods. I can recall only one, a small hole in the wall, run by a Chinese importer who somehow managed to get some foreign supplies. The, the, the uh, inflation rate was so great that our embassy was officially, that is officially according to our government, running on the black market. And of course, if things were difficult for an embassy with access for, to diplomatic uh, Recourses, they were much harder for ordinary Indonesians, trying to cope with out-of-control inflation, extremely unreliable power supply, telecommunications always unreliable if they worked at all, shortages of all kinds, and roads and railways in terrible condition. The government was even positively anti-economic. I remember our ambassador, Mick Shan, coming back to the embassy one day after a call on Hyrule Saleh, the Deputy Prime Minister in charge of the economy. Saleh had shown Mick a wall chart containing about 100 major projects. When Mick asked which ones had the highest priority, Saleh had replied, they all have the highest priority. Walking in the city one day, I came across an, an American embassy colleague leaning pensively against a wall, watching the passing show. I asked him what he was thinking about. He said that, given the economic pressures, he'd been pondering whether everyone walking by, every Indonesian walking by, had a racket, meaning a way of earning a second income, since official wages and salaries were so derisory. Well, do they, I asked? Yes, he replied. <laughs> and I recall one of our trade officers at the embassy, sitting here today, coming back after a trip to a major region of Java, quite excited. Why are you so excited, we asked. We found one factory that was working, he replied. <laughs> Politically, things were strange and not easy for newcomers to grasp. Sukarno had turned from the successful West Irian campaign to crushing Malaysia, conducted in a flourish of symbolism and rhetoric. Early in 65, he'd taken Indonesia out of the United Nations, claiming to set up CONIFO, the Conference of the New Emerging Forces, in its place. All Indonesia's efforts internationally were to promote the NIFOs, the new emerging forces, against the declining but malevolent presence of the older foes, the old established forces, and Nekalim, neo-colonialists and imperialists. In, a, in one of his Independence Day speeches, he launched the concept of the Pyongyang, Peking, Hanoi, Phnom Penh, Jakarta Axis, which he said was the alliance which history had most certainly uh, decreed. Domestically, the constant mantra was nasakong, from the Indonesian words for nationalism, religion and communism, which Sukarno had formulated in the 1920s and which in recent years had come to play a bigger and bigger part in his rhetoric. Government propaganda was all pervasive, and the barrage, while it lasted, was daunting and effective. Westerners, of whom there were in fact not many in Indonesia at that time, found themselves in an unfriendly, if not actively hostile environment, in which the prevailing assumptions about rights and wrongs were not ones they shared. Increasingly Indonesians, despite former Western friends or happy stays in Western countries, kept their distance. 
And the Indonesian Communist Party, the PKI, and its Secretary General, DN Aydit, prospered in this environment and indeed played a major part in endorsing and promoting Sukarno's policy pronouncements and inclinations. Living in Jakarta in the period leading up to September 65, one was conscious of the ideological campaign espoused by Sukarno and embraced by the PKI intensifying. Of course, it overlay a much less monolithic situation. Muslims, as represented by the NU and the Muhammadiyah, did not support Sukarno's emphasis on the Qom in Nasakom, nor his wish to see Indonesia hasten to enter the socialist stage of the revolution. Nor did significant portions of the PNI, nor the army. There were serious clashes going on over land rights, in East Java in particular. But all the potentially opposition forces seemed helpless in the face of a rhetoric and ideology with which they were in fundamental disagreement. Why was this? I think a great deal has to be ascribed to the personality and skills of Sukarno, who certainly capitalised on his being the nation's founding and only president. Many of the generals who, after the attempted coup, came to oppose him, had, like both Nasutian and Suharto, served under his instructions and authority all their working lives, and like him, believed in the independent Indonesia that they'd all, in their various ways, worked to bring about. There were various ways in which competition between groups took place, however. One of the aspects of Indonesia in those days that struck me was how many of, many of the things that make up the daily round in quote, normal, unquote, countries were absent. There weren't many outlets for young people's energy. There wasn't a, a national football competition that commanded attention, crowds and adulation as ours do. But there were a lot of young people. So what was the outlet for their energy? One outlet was to join one of the various youth groups associated with political parties. That got you a uniform shirt green, red or black, and if you were lucky, in the weekends a truck to take you around the countryside until you came upon a truck with youths wearing shirts of a different colour, upon which a satisfying brawl might ensue. But clashes like that weren't the only way political parties could seek to influence events. In July this year, the former Indonesian trade minister, Dr Marie Pangestu, visited Canberra for the 50th anniversary of the ANU's Indonesia project. She was a girl when I was in Jakarta and knew her father, Dr. Pang Lai Kim, who was one of the very few Indonesian economists then who dared to be publicly critical of the PKI and its policies. He published a cyclist-styled weekly called Business News. And one day he dropped in at our house very upset he had just been the subject of a denunciatory editorial in the PKI newspaper, Haryan Rakyat, the People's Daily. And the common view at that time was that if you were lucky, you could survive one People's Daily attack, but if you were attacked twice, you were finished. Fortunately for Pung, the attack on him took place in late September, and more momentous events in intervened. And there was violence in the air at that time. Uh, since this is the 50th anniversary of the coup and not the 29th, uh, various uh, government documents have now been declassified and I had a look uh, uh, the other day at what the embassy had been reporting in the period leading up to the coup. And on the October the 1st, there was a, uh, an embassy weekly political report which said, there has been increasing talk in recent days, even in qualified fashion from Sukarno himself, of the necessity of bringing economic manipulators to justice and then shooting them in public. The demands for public executions of corruptors, etc., are multiplying rapidly and are, of course, being taken up with particular enthusiasm by the PKI's front organisations. And going back a couple of weeks earlier, I came across a memo by Ambassador Shan, which I must say I was quite unaware of until, until I, I found it in the archives, which reads as follows. 
Many, indeed I think most of my colleagues, feel that this place is in for an imminent political explosion. I do not share this view while Sukarno remains in power, but I believe that when he does go, there will be an unmanageable political eruption. One minister told me some time ago that Indonesia had never been so disunited politically. Marta Donata, who was a Navy admiral, said to me last week that little account should be taken of superficial unity, as there were all sorts of things going on all over the place. So people could see that uh, the situation was tense, uh, there was a potential for violence, though, of course, uh, people didn't know exactly what was going to happen. I'd just like to conclude uh, uh, briefly with uh, one other point, and that is uh, to refer to the importance of the Marion affair in what happened in 1965. In Ma in, in the Marion affair refers to a, an arm clash between the army and the PKI in central Java in 1948. Earlier today, David Reeve talked of what a small group of leading individuals really were directing events through all these years. They all knew each other and they'd been bouncing off each other in a friendly or unfriendly way for years. And Mardi Un, as I realised looking back, was only 17 years before the events of 65. And we were all a lot younger in the embassy then, and 17 years seemed a long period of time. It doesn't seem so long now. And even the personnel who took part in the events of Mardi Un were the same people as were involved in 65. When the army or when the government decided that the PKI insurrection or takeover of power, whatever it was in Mardi Un, should be put down, the army commander, General Sadiaman, was ill and wasn't on hand. So it was the then Colonel Nasutian who was given the task of putting down the PKI forces. At that time, uh, Idit already had an important PKI post. So it seems to me that we have to think of the events of 65 in a context that gives weight to the fact that Indonesia was at that time still a very young country indeed. Not many years at all had passed since the Declaration of Independence, since those events in the late 40s, and since those principal actors started to interact. And, I mean, they were a lot of them were very young men. Sukarno was in his 60s, Nasutian in his 50s. Aidit, Yani and Suharto were all only in their 40s. It was a very intense experience of, for all of them, obviously. And... Uh, and it wasn't an experience in which events of an earlier part would have been consigned to the past. And can I close with a quote from William Faulkner that Michael Wesley used somewhere the other day? The past is never dead. It's not even past. Thank you. <laughs>